Pastor Fitzpatrick. Okay. <laughs> good to already... see everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are taking up S4, which was, uh, it's, it's an act relating to um, procedures involving firearms. The bill was just referred to us from the, um, from the Senate. Um, I'll ask Eric to do a quick overview. I don't think we need to walk through. Um, this is um, S30, it was originally S30 that, um, that passed uh, the legislature and was vetoed by the governor. And so this is what's is being referred to as compromise bill. Because um, Eric will tell us is there's um, the only change in the, the bill from S30 um, from 30 days to seven days in the uh, default receipt section. Uh, so it's a little bit of background. So with that, good afternoon and welcome, Eric. <laughs> good afternoon, thank you. Um, and good afternoon to everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the, the Office of Legislative Council here to uh, talk with the committee as the chair mentioned about uh, Senate Bill number four. S4 just recently uh, came over to the house from the Senate. Uh, and uh, a moment or two of background and the chair started to cover this. Uh, you, S4 is essentially identical to S30, the, the bill that the legislature passed that this committee and, and this body and both bodies in fact passed and sent to the governor uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with one change. There's only one substantive or actually one change at all between S30 and S4, but uh, uh, the, the vehicle on which to uh, send legislation uh, to redraft legislation to send it back to the House from the Senate was S4, which was originally a, uh, a firearms waiting period bill. Uh, but since S30 had already uh, gone through the legislative process and been vetoed by the governor, uh, there had to be another vehicle if uh, legislation on this topic was going to proceed again this year. So S4 happened to be uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It had, was actually from uh, the first year of the biennium last year. So the bill that you have in front of you is a strike all to S4. It strikes everything that was originally in S4 and it replaces it with uh, exactly what was in S30, except for the one change uh, that the chair mentioned. And that one change is uh, very simply to do with the default proceed process. I'm sure you remember well uh, that process. The committee discussed it at length. Uh, the idea there is that uh, under, under federal law, when a firearm is transferred and a background check is conducted, uh, the, the uh, inquiry is made to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS. And uh, if there's no response provided by NICS to the, to, the, uh, to the dealer, who then the proposed transfer, uh, sorry, if there's no response provided within three business days. So that's the key operative period of time under federal law, if there's no response provided within three business days, then the transfer may proceed. Now, it's not a requirement. The transfer doesn't have to proceed. The, the transferor doesn't have to go ahead with it, but it, it is permitted. So that's the federal background. But you may remember in S30, what passed the, the legislature was essentially um, a repeal of that default proceed process so that the way the language in S30 was phrased, uh, the transfer could not proceed until uh, a positive response was gotten uh, back from NICS that the person was not prohibited from possessing a fire. So uh, there was no longer any default proceed process that would apply to a transfer. Uh, instead, the person who was transferring the firearm and the dealer who was conducting the background check could not proceed, couldn't go ahead with it until they got this response from Nix saying, um, you know, the background check is complete and that person's not prohibited from possessing. So that's the provision uh, that was formed the basis of the governor's veto. And in response to that, the Senate has uh, made a change in the language in S4, which uh, goes to a period of seven business days. So it, it is a, a, a uh, variant of the default proceed process that still exists, but it's lengthened. So instead of not having a default proceed process at all, it's longer. So that if the, uh, the inquiry is made to the, to the next system about a proposed purchaser of a firearm uh, and no response is received from NICS within seven business days, and 
emphasizing business, so you don't count weekends or holidays. If no response is received within that time, then the transfer may proceed. The seller may go ahead with it. Again, same as before, it's not required. It's same as under federal law, I should say. It's not required that the transfer proceed, but it may. And um, that is, that is the only difference between what you see before you in S4 and what you pass in S30. The other provisions are exactly identical, verbatim, no, no language change at all. So um, that's, that's basically it. That's the change. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any sure. questions for Eric about the, about the language? Okay. Thank you. And um, so in terms of the, the Senate, uh, I believe the only witness the Senate heard from um, was uh, Jay Johnson from the governor's um, council. Uh, we did invite her, I mean, for this, for S4, um, uh, we did invite her to testify. I haven't gotten an update, but um, as earlier, Amber had not heard back, but, um, but she was clear in her testimony that, um, that seven days is acceptable to the governor and that there were no, um, that, that the governor was, was supported or was fine with the rest of the bill, that it was really just this one, one section of 30 days that was um, the subject of the veto. Um, so, but I thought it would be helpful for us to hear from, um, from Chris Bradley and then Sarah Robinson, uh, just to give them, give them the opportunity to, uh, just to state on the, on the record their their thoughts about S4. So good afternoon, Chris, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chair Grad. I, we greatly appreciate uh, the ability to give uh, very brief testimony on, on S30, uh, excuse me, S4. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Bradley. I am a registered lobbyist and I'm also the president and executive director of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Again, I'd like to thank Chair Grad and, and the committee uh, to allow the Federation uh, to give testimony on what is now S4. Uh, regarding section one, which is 13 VSA 4023, the state of Vermont already had a statute, 13 BSA 3705, that was working to keep guns out of hospitals. When the bill was initially submitted, it included daycares and government buildings, but those facilities were later removed because representatives indicated that 3705 worked and worked well for them. In regards to how 4023 will be enforced, it is an identical process to 3705. With 3705, law enforcement could use discretion to resolve a conflict with the outcome being fines and even jail time if the situation could not be resolved amicably. This was as opposed to having strict liability, no discretion, no jail time, and only a minor fine. We do acknowledge that hospitals are places where emotions can run high. We do not, however, believe that this new law will stop violence in hospitals if someone is intent on carrying out such a heinous deed, and we conjecture that the number of people who may be cited under this new law will be zero. Regarding Section 2, uh, that would be 13 VSA uh, 4019, the Federation agrees that firearms should not be possessed by people who should not have them. We believed, however, that there was solid rationale for the default proceed to occur after three full business days as per federal law, and that in those rare situations where a firearm was allowed to be transferred due to a default proceed, they were followed up on by the FBI and the ATF. Regarding sections three, four, and five, we did not object to these sections, although we will say that the change to 13 VSA 4021, which would be the large capacity ammunition feeding devices, will become moot when the Supreme Court of the United States rules on the issue of high capacity magazines. Regarding section six, studies show that violence decreases after an RFA is filed. We know that temporary RFA cases are decided by the weight of a feather. We know that when a temporary RFA is granted, over 50% of the time, those cases never go to a final hearing due to the cases being withdrawn or dismissed, 
which means property will be likely seized just to be given back within two weeks. We know that at one point it was stated it was a rare occurrence that a judge would order relinquishment in a temporary RFA situation, but we now know that these are occurring with greater frequency. Well, we can now say that DV violence goes down after an RFA is filed for the simple reason that there is visibility on the DV situation. We are deeply concerned that this may well foment violence when people have their possessions taken without the due process of law, without any liability for damage to those firearms being stored and transported back and forth. We reiterate our opposition to this bill, but we do thank the committee and Chair Grad for the opportunity to speak to it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for, for Chris? <clears throat> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sarah Robinson, welcome. Good afternoon, thank you so much for having me. For the record, Sarah Robinson from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and thank you so much for your consideration of S4 today. The bill that you are considering and have spoken about earlier in the session includes several important provisions impacting victims of domestic violence. And the network supports S4 as passed by the Senate. We've previously testified in both this committee and in Senate committees regarding the important improvements included in this bill related to firearm possession in hospital buildings, improvements to the extreme risk protection order process, and most importantly, uh, codifying and clarifying the available forms of relief for survivors in emergency relief from abuse order proceedings. Our position and testimony on these items have not changed and we're heartened to see each of these components in the bill before you today. But today I just wanted to speak very briefly about the one piece of the bill that has changed, the so-called Charleston loophole, also known as default proceed firearm transfers. As Attorney Fitzpatrick outlined, S-4 includes a seven-day default proceed provision pertaining to firearms and federal background checks. In our view, this represents a modest but still very important improvement over the current status quo three-day period. According to a study from the Government Accountability Office, when a firearm transfer is denied because the purchaser is prohibited by law, the most common prohibition is a record of misdemeanor domestic violence. Domestic violence records are also a primary factor in firearms transfers where the background check is not returned um, and those that require additional investigation. In those so-called yellow light background checks, additional investigation is needed to determine whether a potential purchaser is in fact prohibited by law. And to make this determination regarding misdemeanor domestic violence records, it takes the FBI between nine and 10 business days on average, according to the best available data. So the seven day default proceed provision included in S4 will undoubtedly represent an improvement over the current practice and law by providing additional time for these investigations to be completed. Sarah? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, before you go too, too much further, can you repeat what you were saying about the nine and 10 day thing with the FBI? Gladly, yes. So um, when there are those so-called yellow light cases where the background check is not returned and the FBI needs to do additional investigation to determine um, information about an individual, a potential purchaser's record. Um, when they are doing those investigations and they ultimately result in a denial of uh, the background check, for those denials that are related to misdemeanor domestic violence, they take on average between nine and 10 days to complete um, those background checks. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and um, excuse me, Martin. Uh, a follow-up question. Is that nine and 10 uh, business days or calendar days, if you know? Uh, it is business days. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the seven day 
default proceed provision that's included in the bill that you're considering today will undoubtedly represent an improvement over the current practice, will hopefully um, net more of those misdemeanor domestic violence denials by providing <laughs> some additional time for investigations to be completed. Um, and I just wanted to note that, you know, and I, this I'm sure comes as no surprise, but as a matter of policy, uh, the Vermont Network supports fully closing the Charleston loophole as was proposed in previous legislation, simply because we do not believe anyone who's prohibited from possessing a firearm due to domestic violence should be able to purchase one. Um, but we absolutely believe that the seven day window included in this bill is a clear improvement um, and we support the bill and we encourage you to pass it swiftly. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> No, no, don't see, don't see any questions. Thank you. So, um, I the um, schedule said um, committee discussion possible vote. We're going to hold off because we have um, two members of our committee are in uh, House Human Services um, on the uh, adoption bill. So we'll, we'll wait for them to come back. So, and Will is yeah, yeah. Um, but we we could still we could still vote today. Um, so, and I think that was it. So I think I would like to take a take a recess break until um, Kate and Kim come back. So we'll just keep you posted, uh, or we could keep the keep this open. Well, Zoom open and end the live, end the live stream. stream. Yeah, yeah. But we'll keep the Zoom open. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hop on. I'm going to see if I can.